Hi, nice to meet you. I'm great. And you? Yeah, really doing well. Uh, thank you for being there so late uh, in, in, in Poland. But yeah, this is the this is the, the opportunity that a uh, virtual conference enable us to have everybody from anywhere. Uh, so uh, yeah, your screen is shared. Uh, the stage is yours for uh, 30 minutes. Uh, yeah, enjoy uh, your presentation. Thank you. So nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm very sad that we can see each other face to face. Uh, but at least you can see me, I can virtualize you in my mind. Uh, so my name is Machi Trader. This is my handle. You can find me on all of those social networks uh, which logotypes you see right now. And as has been already said, we are going to answer the question, what is JWT? The presentation is available for you offline. Uh, you can scan this QR code and download the PDF on your end or uh, or follow it on the website, on the speaker deck. Uh, so you will be always on track uh, with what we are speaking about um, and, and you can come back to it afterwards. So I guess that everyone already scanned it who, has, uh, who, who was interested in. Uh, let's get to answer this question. And I would like to start from the story about love. So I'm asking you all to get back in your mind to the, to the school time when uh, you were in the classroom, you were first meeting your friends, you have been six, seven or eight years old, depending on where are you from and where you grew up. So this is our classroom. Let's meet the actors and the three most important persons here. On the very left, you can see Tom. On the very right, you can see Kate. And in the middle, we have a bad guy, a Peter, uh, who is going to make some mess in our communication. So what's going on here is that Bob is going to pass the message to Kate that he very, very likes her because obviously children doesn't use the word love. They at, at the very end of their vocabulary is the word like. So he writes the message, puts it into the letter, into letter, into envelope, and asks his friends to pass it over uh, to Kate. But the message meets the bad guy who changes the content. So here how disaster comes. Kate becomes angry. Bob starts to cry. So they need to somehow figure out this issue and find a way to communicate between themselves uh, without any interruption from any man in the middle. So what they decided to do is to exchange the key which they are going to use to cipher their messages, to decrypt them, to encrypt them. So if they share just one key, this is called the symmetric cipher. So this is an example of symmetric cipher when you use the same algorithm for decrypting as for encrypting. Of course, the message is hard to read for Bob, but for, excuse me, for, uh, for Peter, who is our man in the middle. But if the key gets compromised, then Peter has access to manipul to the message. He can as well read it as produce uh, new ones. And Akam at Akamai, where I am working, we believe that sharing secrets is, uh, secret is seriously insecure. So the, what addressed this problem is asymmetric cipher. So asymmetric cipher is when you have two keys, one is private, one is public. You are sharing public with everyone to who you want to send message, or in other words, who you want to enable to send messages to you. Because those people are going to use this uh, key to encrypt messages, so you will be the only person who is able to decrypt them and read the message. Uh, an example of getting uh, the asymmetric uh, keys, uh, you, you can see it right now. First of all, you need to find the two prime numbers. Uh, let it be 11 and 3 for, to make calculations uh, more easy. Once we have those numbers, we need to calculate the modulus. So that would be the exponential of our key, the number of letters which we have in the alphabet. So how many characters 
can we encrypt with the key? Later, we need to solve the equation for phi, which will be necessary uh, to choose the exponent for the first key, the, the, uh, the number which need to be relatively prime uh, to, to 20. What relatively prime means is that those two numbers have exactly one greatest common factor. And in this case, this common factor is one, of course. Uh, now we need to calculate the exponent for the key, uh, for the second key in the pair. To do that, you need to solve the equation e multiplied by d minus one modulus phi equals zero. Quite complicated, but uh, it, it, will, it will be easy with such small numbers. Uh, so we've got a d, which is equal seven, of course. So our public and private key pair it's uh, mm, uh, it's uh, are uh, the modulus 33, the number of characters and exponents three and seven respectively. So now when as well Bob as Alice have calculated their keys, they can exchange public key and keep their private keys in secret. So they are enabled to asymmetrically cipher their messages uh, using their keys. And right now, if someone, if the bad guy, bad guy is in the communication when the public keys are exchanged, he is only allowed to write messages to encrypt them with public keys, but he can't read them. But we can still resolve this issue. Uh, of course, the, this person would be able to break the RSA because he have a modulus, so he could he could calculate what two prime numbers has been used to produce this modulus. But in a real case scenario, that would take a lot of time because the prime numbers are much, much bigger. And right now you can see an example of 1024 bits modulus, which is produced out of those two numbers, P and Q. So how to solve the problem when the public key is compromised and someone is still able to produce messages? This is where signing comes to the stage. Signing is a way of proving who is the author of the message. To sign your message using the asymmetric key cryptography, you just need to write it, hash this message, encrypt your hash using your private key, combine this hash with the message and encrypt all of that using their public key. So when the when Kate uh, receives message from Bob to prove, if she wants to prove who is the sender, she need, of course, receive it. Later on, decrypt this message using the private key which she possess from Bob. And once she get an original message and the encrypted hash, she can hash the original message, decrypt received hash using her private key, using uh, their public key, the public key from Bob, and compare those two hashes to be sure that message has not been manipulated. Similar scenario is when you want to share some plain text with a lot of people and prove that you are the author, like king in the kingdom and citizens. So King, instead of asking everyone to, uh, to prepare their keys and his own keys and exchange those information between each other, he doesn't do that. What he can do is, of course, use his key to prove the plain text, like with a stamp and produce the edict, which says that I am the author. This is my plain text. This is my edict. Everyone can read it. It's not encrypted but it's signed by me to prove that I am, uh, I am the, the author of this edict. So what King does, he produces his pair of keys, keep the private key secret, he is going to use it to sign edicts and share his public key with everyone who is interested in. To produce such message, King of course need to create it. Later on, he calculates the hash Combine the encrypt this hash using his private key, 
combine those two together. And this is what he's sharing with the, with the citizens. When citizens, when citizens want to prove who, uh, who have produced the message, he just need to, of course, get it, then produce the hash, decrypt the signature from the original message and compare hashes. And this is what, ex this is exactly what most people call JSON web tokens. But in fact, this is not JSON web token, but a JSON web signature. Something what you can see across the net, everywhere where, where you will look on. So those are this the JSON web signature is a string uh, of three parts separated by dots. Uh, this string is encoded. If you would try to decode it using just base64 algorithm, you will get a plain text together with some uh, encrypted, uh, encrypted end, encrypted finish. Those three parts are respectively the host header, where you keep an information about the JSON web token, JSON web signature, in fact. The Jose stands for JavaScript object signing and encryption. That's the name of working group, which uh, works on standardizing the representation of integrity uh, and protecting data using JSON structures. Uh, in the blue, you can see the payload. So this is our message, this is the body. And finally, we have the signature which is uh, the encrypted header and body. This part, which were, uh, which is corresponding to encrypted sign from the example with King and citizens. So if this is JSON web signature, what the hell are JSON web tokens? And here I need to probably surprise you because JSON web token does not exist. In fact, it's, it doesn't exist itself. If you are a Java-based person, you could think about the JSON Web Token as an, an abstract class or interface, which is implemented by JSON Web Encryption or JSON Web Signature. And in fact, JSON Web Signature is very often confused with JSON Web Tokens. And this is what we are going to cover today. So if someone is speaking JSON Web Token, probably, he thinks about JSON Web Signature. So we said that JWT uh, consists of three parts. First two are header and payload, and you were able to see uh, some content there. What, how this content is built on? This content is built out of something what is called claims. So those entry in the JSON structure are claims. And claims can be registered, so those are the claims uh, which are defined in the documentation. They specify the algorithm token type, who, who issued this token, uh, about who is this token, who is the receiver, so for who is this token, when it has been issued, how long can it be used, uh, and before what time it shouldn't be used. And finally, you can also assign the identifier of the token if you would like to implement the single-use tokens. But registered claims are not the only claims which, claims which you can provide within the token. There is also a part called custom claims, and those are divided into two groups. The first one is public claims, and the second one is private claims. So basically, you can place inside the token everything what you would like to. But if you would like to avoid name collisions, so you would, uh, you would ping the developer word that only you are using this particular claim name, you should consider registering it as a public claim within the IANA JSON Web Token Registry. If you are using your token internally, uh, probably the private claim is everything what you need. Let's think, let's speak a little bit about some, uh, about some examples of using JSON Web Tokens. If we already know what is JSON Web Token, let's use it in practice. So another scenario which I would like to introduce you today is the authorization. So meet Joanna, 
Uh, on the other hand, on the other side of the stage, we have the authorization service and we have a booking service. We had a gate management service. And finally, we have a flight management service. So you should you could think about this uh, as a the American Airlines or Australian Airlines booking system, which have uh, which can be accessed as well by a customer as an employee. So Joanna is authorizing her, authenticating herself within the authorization server. She is sending her credentials, and in response, probably she got her user ID encrypted, of course, uh, using the private key on the authorization server side. Now, uh, this, uh, this user ID can be stored in cookie or, or anywhere, but whenever Joanna want to make some changes, she want to change the gate or book the flight or cancel the flight, she need to send this, uh, her user ID together with the request. Once the microservice gets that user ID, it must ask the authorization server if this particular user with this user ID is able to perform such actions. So we get a lot of communication here. To get rid of that, you could move the public key, key to the services. So they would be able uh, to, to decrypt the user ID or user privileges on their own. But still decrypting is a very time consuming operations. Uh, so let's introduce JSON web tokens and see how they can improve this flow. So again, Joanna is posting, uh, is sending her credentials to authorization server. And she gets back the token, which contains a private claim uh, called privileges or prefs. And she have a privilege of booking flight, which expires sometime in the future. So when she sends the post message to any of the service, the service, because, uh, because the JSON web token is just encoded and signed to prove that the content has not been malformed, the services can check if she even says that she have this privilege. And if she have it, then we are applying this time consuming operation of verifying the signature using the public private key cryptography. The example implementation of that you can see right now in Spring. So we have a change gate uh, post endpoint uh, and we accept the JSON web token in the header. Uh, what we are doing later, we are decoding this token. So we get it here as a decoded token and checking in the if, if given privilege is in token. And if it is there, we are verifying the signature. Uh, in other cases, we are throwing the authorization failure exception. So some exception handler could deal with that and produce the proper uh, error response. You should think about this as a hash code. So that, that JSON web token is like a hash code. You can preliminary check if something is inside. If it's not, then you are sure that it shouldn't be there. But if something is in token, you have a probability that it should be there. This is the moment when you need to, to, to uh, verify the signature while verifying the signature would be an equivalent to using equal method in Java. Uh, moreover, if you are using the JSON web token authorization and you have a load balancer, if you're in your system, you could uh, put the public key on it and let the load balancer to verify claims and verify signatures. Or if you are using the content delivery network like Akamai, where I am working, you could delegate this uh, to us, to Akamai, uh, who is serving your traffic. So this is an example uh, of the API gateway product, which I had a pleasure to work with where you can define your API, uh, each endpoint. And for each endpoint, you can specify the different rules you want to validate within the JSON web token sent to your, uh, to your uh, API. 
for further reading, you have two links here uh, from myself uh, in the offline presentation. Let's move smoothly to another example of JSON web token usage. So OAuth authentication. So something what you could see right now on the screen, uh, Sam says that it will make the life easier, uh, but after a few years, uh, you can just sign with, with 10 different systems. And I am always forgetting which one I use to sign myself within this particular uh, product. But let's take a look on the OAuth flow. Uh, so we have three actors right now. The first one is the application. Second one is the authorization server. This is the third party server. And finally, the resource server, which is also a third party. So let's say on the very left, we have your mobile application and in the middle and on the right, we have a Facebook. You want to request some resources on Facebook, like pictures, for example. So first of all, you authenticate within the authorization server and get an access token. Then you can use this access token to request for a resource. What resource server does, it validates the token against the authorization server. If the token is valid, then it comes back to you uh, with a resource which you requested for. But if you would implement OAuth authentication using the JSON web token, you could make this JSON web, uh, JSON web token validation on the resource server and do not involve authentication server in the token validation procedure. Uh, so this is, uh, those are two scenarios, uh, which uh, in my opinion are most obvious, uh, usages for JSON web tokens. Let's move to another shortcut, uh, in the family. So JWKS, what is that? What answer, uh, this, uh, this shortcut, uh, what questions this shortcut answers? So first of all, what if your key gets compromised? Uh, what if you want to rotate those? What if you want to invalidate someone's access? We have a JSON web key set, which is an answer for all of those problems. And uh, what JSON web key set is, is just a repository where you can keep any key, in fact, but for the JSON web token case, you will keep there your public keys. So this is the token validation flow for JSON JWKS. So Joanna asks the authorization server for her JSON web token. In the response, she got uh, that uh, token with the privileges in the payload and additional field in the header. That field is key ID and, uh, and JKU, which stands for JSON key URL. So when, uh, when Joanna tries to book something, the booking service navigates, goes to the JWKS specified under this URL and asks for key with ID 12. In the response, JWKS gives the, the, booking, uh, the booking service requested public key, which is used to verify the signature. So that's JWKS basics. Uh, and in the in the wide look, how keys are kept in JWKS? So they are kept as a JSON object, uh, which specifies the key uh, the key specific data. Like what is the key type? Of course, what is the ID? What algorithm this key is prepared for? How it should be used? If this is for signature or for encrypting uh, or decrypting? As I said, you can keep any key in the JWKS. In our case, JSON Web Token, we have public key used for verifying signature. What is the exponent? This is another part of JSON Web Key. And finally, the modulus of the key. So if you would recall the example from the very beginning where we were calculating the asymmetric keys per, we had this exponent and modulus those are corresponding uh, E and N in this, uh, in this example. Hi, Maciej, you have five minutes. Sure thing. Uh, so the other thing which you can keep inside JSON web key set 
because as I said, it's not only for public keys, are uh, data specific for the private keys, like certificate or Chinese reminder algorithm. Let's take a look how JSON Web Key Set helps to prevent the bad guys scenario. So the scenario here is that the uh, that Bob has compromised somehow the private key from the authorization server and produced the token on his own using this private key. So he produced the valid signature. But once this leak has been found, the authorization server rotates the keys and change them in the JWKS. So now whenever Bob comes to the change gate, uh, change gate service and change gate service request for key with ID 12, it's no longer corresponding to the private key which Bob has compromised. So the access is denied. Uh, okay, and that's all in fact from my side. We have at the very end pitfalls and vulnerabilities. Because we are running out of time, I'm going to skip some of them uh, and mention just quite, uh, just, uh, just few. What you should be aware of, first of all, don't rely only on your header when you are validating JSON Web Tokens, because token can be as well unsigned. Another vulnerability which you should uh, look for, and it's not so obvious, uh, is my favorite one, which is uh, here. Always verify the JSON key URL which is provided in the header. Imagine the situation that the bad guy, the attacker, have set up his own JWKS and this is what he is pointing to in the header. Do you see it here? Attacker com. This is his JSON web key set rather than uh, server, uh, rather than yours JSON web key set. So in such case, he would be, uh, he would, uh, the, the access would be granted for him. And this is also the reason why if you are using Akamai, we are always, uh, always asking you to provide the JSON web key set URL, which we should trust that this is your JWKS. Uh, that's all from my side, summarizing JSON web tokens are not JSON web tokens. Those are JSON web signatures confused with JSON web tokens. Uh, this is a great way of exchanging the stateless data. But remember, this is for data which is not very sensitive. That's not a place for credit card numbers or social security numbers. Uh, that's a place for sharing something what can be read by everyone, but shouldn't be manipulated by, by, uh, by others. I've got resources for you. And one more time, I would like to ask you for a feedback, uh, but the most important link is here at the very end. So if you will scan this one and get the presentation offline, you will be able to follow uh, all the other links. That's Thank you, all. Jane. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matei. Thank you. We have like really 30 seconds to answer just one question uh, from Savio uh, Mascarenas. How do we validate the access token in the resource server? Maybe you answered that in your talk, but that was his question. Oh, yeah. Uh, you are you are asking about the OAuth uh, yeah, flow. Yeah, the OAuth, yes. Uh, so first of all, this is out of the scope of the presentation, but my assumption is that the access token uh, is also generated somehow encrypted using public private key cryptography. Uh, so, so this is what comes uh, to the user. And when this, uh, this comes to the, to the resource server uh, and resource server sends it to the authorization, then authorization server uses the, uses the key to decrypt the message, decrypt this authorization token, take a look what is inside and give back any information if this access token uh, passes the validation or not. Yeah, thank you, Maciej. Uh, as, as we said before the talk, you will be there in the chat because we have yeah. some other questions coming. Uh, so please answer them in the chat of the stage. Thank you very much, Maciej, uh, for, uh, for being with us today and sharing your pre presentation.